Hey everyone, welcome back to part 2 of the video where we take a look at the interior of the Cessna C152. In the last video we had a look at the exterior where we identified the various parts of a light GA aircraft. So if you guys haven't checked it out, please do so. Also please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button along with the bell notification for future content. Please do share this video to anyone who may find it useful or interesting. Let's get started. So welcome on board the cabin of the C-152. Nothing much, not like a modern airliner, but it is complicated and dizzying at the start nonetheless. You have two seats, one for the pilot and passenger or co-pilot or the instructor and the student if it's operated as a trainer. The student sits on the left and the instructor on the right. You have a three-point seat belt with a shoulder harness, much like the ones in a car which are manually adjustable. Behind you have a windscreen for better visibility and space to carry some important and legal stuff like the documents consisting of aircraft manuals, operator's handbook, airworthiness certificate, etc. A first aid kit, a fire extinguisher and some more. In our case we have a blue tow bar. Now this being a sim, the rest are not present nor are they important so we can skip that. So here we have a mechanical door with a latch and the window which can be opened in flight. Ahead you have the windscreen and below you have the instrument panel. Let's start from the top. Above the top left A pillar you have the cabin air inlet which can be opened or closed by hand. On the top right A pillar you have a temperature gauge which measures the outside air temperature or OAT in degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit. Why is that necessary for your true airspeed or TAS, density, altitude calculations and to determine the freezing levels and icing conditions. Directly above you have the magnetic compass and behind you have an information placard as to what type of flying and flight maneuvers are allowed. Beside that you have the sun visors, above on the roof you have the housing for the dome lights and the speakers. Let's move on to the instrument panel. In the middle you have the Cessna badge in case you forget who made your aircraft. Left of it you have the audio panel with various knobs to adjust the volume of your headphone, intercom and the speaker. Beside that we can see the visual indicators for when you approach the outer, middle and inner marker beacons. Over to the right you have the compass deviation card. Moving down and in front you have the six essential instruments which every pilot needs. This is commonly referred to as a six pack. I'll probably make a more detailed video about the six pack in the future but for now we'll just talk about what they do. On the top left you have the airspeed indicator which displays the indicated airspeed or IAS of the aircraft in knots or nautical miles per hour. Those colored markings are speed limitations which are enforced due to the structural limits of the airframe. The small window on the needle shows the speed equivalent in miles per hour. Top center you have the artificial horizon which provides pitch and roll or bank information in degrees. The knob what you see below is an adjustment knob to adjust the crosshair for the pilot's line of vision. At the moment, it is toppled as it runs using gyroscopes which are turned off. Over to the right, you have the altimeter which indicates the altitude of the aircraft in feet and is mostly measured with reference to mean sea level or a specific datum. This knob is used to adjust the QNH or the altimeter setting. It reads in both hectopascal and inches of mercury. Bottom left we have a turn coordinator which shows the direction and rate of turn and roll as well as coordination. Bottom center we have a direction or heading indicator which indicates the magnetic heading and direction of flight above the magnetic north. The knob to the left is used to realign the indicator with that of the magnetic compass to correct it for gyro drift and the right one is the heading bug. And finally bottom right we have a vertical speed indicator which indicates the rate of climb 
rate of descent of an aircraft as well as level flight. It measures in hundreds of feet per minute. So those were the six instruments of the pilot six pack. On the center we have a clock which is adjustable using the knob. Left of it we can see a suction gauge to measure the suction produced by the engine driven suction pump which powers the artificial horizon and the direction indicator gyroscopes. A couple warning or information placards for the maneuvering speed and spin recovery procedure. On the top we have the aircraft registration badging. Below that you have the yoke or control column which controls the pitch and roll of the aircraft and is directly connected to the flight control surfaces as previously demonstrated. You pull back to pitch up, push forward to pitch down, rotate left to bank or roll left and vice versa on the right. On the left grab handle we can see the red button for the PTT or push to talk functionality which when pressed and held allows us to talk to the pilots of other aircraft or ATC controllers on designated VHF frequency channels. On the side you have two other dials. These are the HSI or horizontal situation indicators whose operation is linked to the NAV frequency panel on the right. They can be used to tune onto VORs for navigation and localizers and glide slopes for instrument approaches. The OBS or omni bearing selector knob is used to tune the radial or course you intend to follow. Over to the right you have the avionics stack which houses the navigation and communication equipment. You have two of each allowing you to set up up to four frequencies separately for both of them using the standby and active channels. They are tuned using the rotary dials and can be swapped across the channels using the transfer button. The volume can be adjusted as well. Below we have the DME or distance measuring equipment panel which is coupled to the nav sources 1 and 2 above. Below that we can see the Garmin GTX 330ES transponder or transmitter responder which responds to ground based ATC stations and other aircraft in the vicinity to convey position information for identification. The various modes such as standby, mode alpha or charlie etc and the squawk code can be selected using the soft keys present. Moving on, here we have the tachometer or the RPM gauge which shows the engine speed in hundreds of revolutions per minute. Below that you can see the engine run timer or Hobbs meter. Now just like a car, we need to know when maintenance or a complete overhaul is necessary to maintain a good working engine. Think of it like your car's odometer. Below that you have the control column for the instructor or co-pilot and both move in conjunction with each other. To the right of that at the bottom you have an optional autopilot panel. Now this is a simple autopilot which provides only basic functionality but makes a world of difference by reducing pilot workload considerably especially in the sim. Above that you have the control panel for the ADF or automatic direction finder which is an other albeit old navigational system. It gives the relative bearing of the aircraft with respect to the nav aid or non-directional beacon or, an, or the NDB it's tuned on to. You can see the dials used to set the frequency and the various modes of operation. ADF or BFO which stands for beat frequency oscillator etc to name a few. Hopefully in the future I will make a video on VOR NDB navigation using analog instruments as this is a skill which every IFR rated pilot must have. Above that you can see a warning placard and further above you can see the ADF bearing indicator with an adjustment knob. Right beside you can see the ammeter using which we can see the current draw into or from the battery. This is a center zero ammeter. The left portion indicates a discharge from the battery and could mean either the alternator is not switched on or has failed. Whereas the right shows that the alternator is switched on and is supplying electrical power to the other equipment as well as charging the battery up in the process. 
the red light below that is a low voltage indicator. Moving across to the bottom left, we have the park brake, which when pulled, retains brake fluid pressure on the rear wheels with our feet off the rudder pedals. Below that is the primer plunger, whose function is to supply fuel through an atomizer in its vaporized state to help start a cold engine. Beside that, you have the two red split switches, one for the engine-driven alternator and the other for the main battery. Right of that, we have the ignition, which helps start the engine. You have two magnetos, which are connected to each of the four cylinders, the left and the right magneto. The R or L means only one magneto is supplying the spark to all the cylinders. Both means both the magnetos are providing the spark. Rotating the key to the spring loaded far end ends up spinning the starter motor, which, well, as the name suggests, starts up the engine. It springs back to the both position once let go. Beside that, you have the interior and exterior lighting panels with dials to adjust the intensity of the interior lights. We also have a switch to electrically heat the pitot tube. Above you have the fuel quantity indicators for each wing which indicates fuel quantity in pounds and US gallons. To the right we have the engine oil temperature and oil pressure indicators. Here we have the carburetor heat knob to prevent icing inside the carburetor, especially at low power settings and moderately low outside air temperatures and high relative humidity. Carb icing can cause a loss in engine power and a reduction in performance. The throttle controls a fuel air mixture which enters into the cylinder via a throttle valve located inside the carburetor and functions like a gas or accelerator pedal on your car. Push it in for more power and pull it out to reduce power and to idle the engine. The red mixture knob controls the amount of fuel that is being mixed with the air. Pushing it in ensures a rich mixture or a higher fuel to air ratio. Pulling it out ensures a lean mixture or a low fuel to air ratio. Pulling it out all the way will cut the fuel completely and cause the engine to cut out. Hence there is a push knob as a safety measure to prevent the pilot from accidentally doing so. Rotating it can provide fine adjustment for more precise settings. Here we have the flap lever and indicator which raises or lowers the wing's trailing edge flaps. You have three settings and up to 30 degrees of deflection. The cabin air knob opens a flap on the right cowling to help cool the cabin while the cabin heat knob extracts the heat from the engine's exhaust via a muffler and directs it to the cabin beneath via near the rudder pedals. I'm not sure what the switch does so if any of you C152 pilots out there could let us know in the comments, it would be very helpful. Beside that, we have what looks to be a 12 volt charging socket. This is an option and not found on all aircraft. This is a more modern C152 with the autopilot and other equipments. Here I think you have the female socket for the aviation headphones, audio out and microphone in. Here we have the circuit breakers for your equipments, a handheld radio or phone and the trim wheel with an indicator beside it. Below you have the rudder pedals which steer the rudder and is used for nose wheel steering on the ground and for braking as well. And finally on the floorboard below the seats you have the fuel cutoff valve. There you have it guys, now as I previously said earlier, this is one of the more well equipped and modern Cessna C152 variants out there with all the bells and whistles and options. Yours may be the same or less equipped. Nonetheless, those were all the parts of a light general aviation aircraft. Hope you liked it and once again a kind request to hit the like and subscribe button with the bell notification and to please share this video to anyone who may find it useful. This was Vishal and I'll see you again. Have a wonderful day ahead.